Guys, welcome to Self Evident Podcast. This is episode number twenty nine. We are almost to number thirty. Yeah, we have Pretty exciting. We have an amazing guest today. We have Mr. Bill Federer. Um, he has been a longtime friend of the ministry. Um, he has definitely mentored Massey and me as well. Um, and we decided we would make a trip out to Fort Myers, Florida, and we want to just give a plug and say thanks to. First Assembly God Church of Fort Myers. Thank you so much for allowing us to do this and giving us a place to host yeah. us. So, um, Massey, how you doing today, man? Bro, I'm we're, with Bill. We're with Bill <laughs> in Florida. I'm with Bill, man. This is amazing. Bill, we want to welcome you, man. M- Massey, Mike, great to be with you. Absolutely. So one of the things that we like to do, obviously, with the podcast is interview people who we know have a voice. We don't care if they're liberal, if they're you know conservative, whatever. Our whole thing is dialogue, right? And so when I met Bill, I remember I was reading Bill's books, boy, for about three or four years. And then I think it was October of 2015 or 2016, 2016, I think it was, we were in Ohio. It was the first time I met you. And I'm like, I'm speaking with Bill Federer. <laughs> like, you know, I'm still, a little, I'm still a little kid in the candy shop. And I'm just like, I got to speak with him. And then another great uh, a guy who I look up to, uh, Dr. Uh, Colonel, I'm sorry, Colonel Eidsmo, Colonel John yeah. Eidsmo. And uh, he was the one that taught the Constitution course that I took that changed my life, that basically told me that separation of church and state was a myth and all these things. And uh, so it was an opportunity for me to like, again, I, you know, what I find funny is uh, I'm learning this as a Hispanic coming from that Hispanic Democratic background, now being a conservative, looking at what's going on and saying, look, we're not all fools here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, liberty and freedom is worth fighting for. And so but what does that mean? Right. Uh, I was just talking to 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 a, a pastor yesterday and, a, and another friend, and this is going to segue into this. And we're we're concerned about getting Christians elected. And he said, you know, we need to get Christians elected. And 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 Paul had said, you know, but it's not just getting Christians elected. Do they know government? And he didn't explain it. I was like, hey, let me explain what he's saying. Yeah. Just getting Christians elected does nothing because if they start passing moral laws, in other words, giving the government authority over God's law. Oh boy, we've got problems. So it's not just Christians getting like Christians who understand government, yep. where the authority really lies in. And we're going to talk about this book right here, which we'll talk about more. But Bill wrote this book, Who is the King? And it's going to talk about 6,000 years basically of history and why America is unique and all these governments and, and all these things. And Bill will quote all this by off his dome. So I'm just going to let you know you're in the presence of a giant. And he'll never say that. I will for him. We'll say it. I know he's probably we'll embarrassed about say me it. saying that. He probably doesn't want me to say that about him, but I'm <laughs> going to say it anyway. Uh, but it's an honor to be with you, Bill. And I kind of wanted to ask you some questions on what does this book, the, the title catches people? Who's the real king in America? Because everybody knows we don't have a king, right? But we treat the president as a king in a lot of ways. So what does the book title mean? Well, here I, you can hold that. Oh, thank you. And uh, by the way, this church, uh, there's a, a pastor, Dan Betzer, and this is a real historic church that has just made mm-hmm. an impact on Florida and the country and the world. So uh, it's a real honor. Again, Amen. I didn't know that. First Assembly uh, in Fort Myers. But uh, the, uh, the book. So after 30 years worth of research and history, I decided an ambitious project. I would research every civilization that's ever existed on the planet. Oh, and, uh, you know, a couple the, hours of research, right? Went back to the beginning <laughs> of the invention of writing, Sumerian oh. cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamian Valley. Today, that's Iraq. So take a stick, poke it in clay. That's the beginning of writing. And uh, then Egyptian hieroglyphics were invented around 3000 BC. Chinese characters, uh, the Yellow Emperor on yep. bamboo mm-hmm. animal books around 2600 BC. But the oldest one is around 3300 BC. There's actually a quote from... Neil deGrasse Tyson, the astrophysicist in his Cosmos TV series, he said, it was here around 5,000 years ago between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that we learned how to write. So even the secular world acknowledges it's around 5,000 years of people writing down records. And so you look at it, um, uh, you know, five to 6,000 years is not that long. No. Uh, I tell people... 6,000 years is just 60 people living 100 years each back to back. So just we, think about that for a minute. <laughs> 60 grandparents living back to back to back. So obviously great, 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 but 60. So yeah, so, so 60 so people. Small. We've all met someone who's lived 100 years, maybe a grandmother. We're talking yeah. 60 grandmothers back to back, 60 people living 100 years each back to back. You're all the way back to the beginning of the invention of writing. 
And so, so all the history that you've read about has taken place within that. that yeah. Period. So what I found is the curiosity is what's what's the most common form of government in these six thousand years? Now that we have these records, let's look right. at them. So the first story recorded is Nimrod Tower of Babel. And the Jewish commentator Josephus said Nimrod wanted to build a tower so high that if God destroyed the world again with a flood, he could survive on top. So it sort of had a defiant, in-your-face attitude toward God. Huh. God comes down, confuses the languages, and the people what? Scatter. Is that where we get the word babbling from? Right, yeah. Uh, the word babble, like somebody that's babbling, that comes from Babylon and... But wow. And so we see this first <laughs> illustration the of, things you learn. of power concentrated, defined against God, and then power separated into the hands of the people. But it's almost like every generation since has tried to rebuild the Tower of Babel. Truth. Only on a bigger mm. scale, because with military advancements, you can kill more people. But it's the same fallen nature of Cain, Kill, and Abel. But instead of using a stone... You now have bronze weapons, and then iron weapons, and then big, long Greek phalanx spears, and then uh, you have the uh, stirrup for riding horses and the composite bow that will recurve on the bow, mm. and then you have yeah. the um, uh, the scimitar sword that the Muslims had, and then you had gunpowder from China, and, and the technology advances, but it's that same fallen nature of Cain, Kill, and Abel. And so uh, St. Augustine actually gave a term to it. It's called libido dominandi the lust to dominate. And so you put some babies in a playpen, one of them will take the rattle from the others. You put some kids on a playground, one of them is the bully hogging the ball. You put some junior high girls in a clique, and one of them is the diva. You put some people in the woods, one of them is the Indian chief, and you put them in an inner city, one of them is a gang leader. And all a king is, is a glorified gang leader. It's a hierarchical system, like a right. pyramid. If you're friends with the king, you're more equal. You're not friends with the king, you're less equal. Right. And if you're an enemy of the king, you're dead. It's called treason. Or you're a slave. And so as this pyramid structure to society it keeps repeating itself all around the world. And as time goes on, it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger because of military advance, which you can kill more people. Oh, and I ask people, imagine if you got to be the king. That'd be pretty neat. Things are going along fine. And then you, you have a sister that you really, really love. And she gets married, has a kid. Maybe you're the, the godparent. And this kid grows up, and now he's starting to hang around the wrong kids. And he's partying and drinking and driving. And one day he hits someone with a car and kills them. Now this teenager is facing manslaughter charges. And your sister comes begging to you. and says, you're, you're not going to let my little Johnny get locked away half his life, are you? What are you going to say to your sister? Well, I'll let little Johnny off the hook this time, but don't let it happen again. Guess what? As soon as you say that, you are the corrupt dictator. Yeah, you pervert a judgment. You just right. sent ripples through your kingdom that if your family or friends with the king, you get special treatment. You're not family. Kind of sounds you familiar don't get it. right now, actually. <laughs> if you think about we, it, uh, we yeah. always complain about that, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, and if you're if, if someone is wanting to point out your favoritism, you're going to be tempted to want to shut them up. And so we see it's, it's this nepotism. You want to give you all your family and friends jobs, right? Yeah. You love it, you know. And then you, and so. This pyramid structure to society of favoritism it keeps repeating itself. And in my book, I sort of walk you through. So uh, the first, oh, the oldest story ever written in, in any language is the Epic of Gilgamesh, around 2500 BC. He, um, what, it was the king of Uruk, like Iraq, it was Uruk. And he um, had this new invention called a wall around the city. He's the one who invented walls around the city, right? Hmm. And, um, uh, but he goes on this long journey to meet this old guy who survived the global flood, so it's called the Epic of Gilgamesh. But uh, then around 2250 BC, you have Sargon of Acadia conquers a bunch of walled cities from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean, and this is considered the first empire. So not just somebody over city, now they're ruling a bunch of cities. And then you have 2,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs. And they keep getting bigger and bigger, and they control the people, the cattle, the land, everything. And then you have 5,000 years of Chinese emperors. And then around 700 BC, Assyria is the biggest empire on the planet. Uh, you have um, uh, their capital of Nineveh, and Sennacherib, and tilgath pileser They take the 10 northern tribes of Israel captive. But Assyria is conquered by Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And it's the biggest empire until it's conquered by Cyrus of Persia. And the Persian Empire is the biggest that the planet had ever seen. Right. And uh, Cyrus lets the Jews go back and rebuild the temple. 
But the Persian Empire is conquered by Alexander the Great. And he has the biggest empire around 300 BC. And then around 45 BC, uh, the Romans have the biggest empire with Julius Caesar. And then Augustus Caesar. And matter of fact, Augustus wanted to have a worldwide census. In other words, he wanted to track everyone. Something about dictators that want to track everybody. It's his version of the NSA or the <laughs> Chinese dragonfly you know, Google project where we want to give everybody a social credit. The government wants to track everybody. And, uh, but then the Roman Empire is conquered 400 A.D. by Attila the Hun. Yeah. He had this enormous empire mm-hmm. with 500,000 soldiers that would wipe out cities. Um, but then you have uh, Islam comes around. And in the 7th century, they conquer from the Persian Gulf to the Atlantic Ocean. They conquer all of Spain in 10 years, and it's the biggest empire. Uh, and then they're stopped from going into France by Charles Martel. His grandfather is Charlemagne, and he has his biggest empire in Europe, and that's around the 800s. And then you have uh, the Vikings conquer, and mm-hmm. then they have this huge empire. But then uh, around the 1200s, it's Genghis Khan, and he conquers from Korea to Hungary, kills 30 million people, and he has the biggest empire. Um, But then you sort of fast forward and you have the king of Portugal has a global empire. Then the king of Spain in the 1500s, he had the biggest empire, Charles V of Spain. The Philippines were named after his son, King Philip of Spain. Was Charles V the one who sent Christopher Columbus basically in private? Was that him? Well, it was Ferdinand and Isabella. And so Charles was their son and um, actually their grandson. But um, but they had the biggest, the the Spanish had the biggest empire. And uh, but... Uh, the Ferdinand Spanish household was was joined with the Habsburgs of Austria. So right. it was the uh, but so Charles V was sort of like the inheritor of both, and he was he had the biggest empire. Uh, then in the uh, 1600s, France comes along, and it has the biggest empire. Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King of France, and he, uh, you know, everything west of the. Appalachians was his, but he had, yeah. you know, Cambodia and Vietnam and all I mean, uh, c- countries all around in Canada. Um, but then in the uh, 1800s, late 1700s, 1800s, England becomes the biggest empire. The sun never set on the British Empire, 13 million square miles and a half a billion people. And so it's sort of like if you've ever seen a nautilus seashell that does the little circle, then it comes around with a little bigger circle, then it comes around with a bigger, bigger circle. That circle is a rate of geometric expansion called phi, P-H-I, or the Fibonacci sequence, where yeah. the number plus the previous number equals the next number. That number plus the previous number equals the next number. That, And it's just gradual increasing, but then it not only increases bigger, it increases at a faster rate getting bigger, right? And Which, isn't that found throughout nature? Yeah, so that, you see that the, you've tornadoes seen in everything. and hurricanes and yeah. even galaxies. And so um, it's a... Um, what um, what do they call it? A uh, non-reasonable uh, number, or, or I'm not using the right term, but it's something that if it was a little bit less, it would collapse on itself, and if it was a little bit more, it would just spin no. off. So it's this rate of expansion that's just perfectly balanced. But anyway, I decided to plot out these empires in world history and see if chronologic chronologically it follows that. And so you go through these empires a little bit, and then they come around a little bit bigger, and then they come around a little bit bigger, come around bigger, till the king of England had the biggest, but they're not done yet. Uh, we still have kings that still have global goals. Um, they're just communist dictators. Yeah, right? true. And so um, you look at uh, you know, social and communism, socialism. Um, Hitler was the head of the National Socialist Workers' Party. Yeah. He was a dictator. He wanted a global empire. Yep. Stalin was the head of what? The USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. He was a dictator. Uh, and Lenin said the goal of socialism is communism. It is this one world yep. government. And I talk to students, and I say, well, now, uh, you think that socialism is every, everybody owns everything equally. Question, um, who decides who lives in the nice house and who lives in the dumpy house? Hmm. <laughs> um, somebody in the government dictates those things. Well, whoever ultimately dictates those things is the dictator. Mm-hmm. So every socialist and communist country has the government dictating things, and at the very top there's a dictator. And the communist party members are the new ruling class. Right? They're, They're the, the royalty. They're the yeah. deep state. And they want to protect themselves, and they want to shut up those that are challenging them. Right? So mm-hmm. Plato even talked about it. You take money from your opponents, and you funnel it to your supporters. <laughs> right? You tax and then take away all the, you know, and then you funnel it as entitlements yeah. to your support. It's just a simple problem. But anyway, 
So we still have this goal, goal of a global government, and that's sort of left for the book of Revelation. You know, it's right. the ultimate yeah. wheat tears grow together till the harvest. God saw that the fruit of Adam's sin was going to be this Antichrist, but um, we sort of leave that to, to God's timetable. But as far as when America's founders were breaking away from England, the king of England was a globalist. He was sort of a one-world government guy, and he wanted to be in charge. And so our founders said, no, we don't like this globalist king telling us what to do. They broke away, and they flipped it and make the, made the people the king. And so it's a polarity change in the flow of power. Instead of power flowing top down from a king, it's flowing bottom up from the people. And so that's what made America great, is right, is, is the idea that you get to be the king of your own life. You get to decide. You don't have a king telling you, oh, you're in this class. Oh, you got to live in this neighborhood. You know, you got to, like in Sharia, you got to wear this clothes, or, or, you know, you have to, can't eat this, and, um, or, or, you know, the caste system in India, where if mm-hmm. you're in the lowest caste, you got to clean the sewers. If you do a really good job, you still can't graduate and become have, a Brahmin. You have to die and, and be yeah. reincarnated in order to make it up. <laughs> and, and so the structure limits your mobility. And, but in America, our founder said, no, we're going to flip it. We're going to make the people the king. So each individual person is king of their lives, and then we are all co-kings of America. So who's the king of America? It's we, the people. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And this kind of begs a question. Maybe you can help out with this, too, if you can bring bring clarity to it why is it then if the people are the king why would john adams say our constitution was only made for a moral and religious people it's wholly inadequate to the government of any other right and people are going to ask this question because they're like oh, i don't have to believe in god and i could still love america and be an american but it's like you see the farther we pull away from god the farther we're pulling away from our laws constitutionally can you explain a little bit on that? Do you think you have an answer for that? All right. So in reading through all of these civilizations, I found an anomaly, something that stuck out that was unusual. It was ancient Israel. So around 1400 BC, Israel comes out of Egypt. They come into the promised land. And for the first 400 years, they don't have a king. Wow, the whole rest of the world's kings and pharaohs and emperors. And here you have a, a whole nation with millions of people and no king. Especially because people are so attracted to put a leader over themselves. You, you get a group of people that are having a meeting. Naturally, we appoint a leader. But you're right. For 400 years, they didn't appoint a single leader. Yeah, so you if know. you think of it, Israel was the beginning of the concept of equality, that everyone you see is equal to you. Uh, there's no royal family somewhere that everybody wants to butter up next to. Yeah. And that the law says there's no respect of persons with God, that male and female are made in the image of the creator, that even the stranger living amongst you is under the same law that you're under. Ancient Israel was the beginning of the concept of equality. I mean, like, we're all equal. There, there's no, yeah. like, royal family somewhere. We're all trying to climb some ladder and butter up next to them and get into a private meeting and have them <laughs> be uh, favorites, you know? And then Israel was the beginning of the idea of tolerance. Here they were worshiping the one true God, and they never felt compelled to force anybody to worship the one true mm-hmm. God, right? They didn't say, well, we're going to subversively go into all these countries and overthrow their governments and have make force everybody to get their lamb and worship Yahweh. It's like, no, it was voluntary. Israel was the first nation with private land ownership because wherever there's a king, you never really own the land. It's always going to be conditional of you staying on the nice side of the king. Think about that, guys. Just think about it. First off, I want to say this. He said all that stuff off the dome. He didn't have a slideshow. I mean, I'm pretty good at what I do, but that was amazing. And I want you guys to do something. Go on AmericanMinute.com. You guys can pick up a DVD of it, also a book of it. I'm just going to keep plugging it through, AmericanMinute.com. And uh, you're just going to find out, how, how many books have you written, Bill? It's about 20. About 20 books. But there's like a good amount of stuff, like The Real Santa Claus, The Real St. Patrick, all these things. So you'll find a lot of different topics and different things like that. Um, I want you to go back to that, though. Like, this is good because the, 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 the concept of people being equal and that everybody's created under God, that's cool, right? But how do they maintain that, right? God gave them a law. There was a law written in their heart. They knew... All those laws, basically the first four were written about us and God. The last six were against me, you and I, right? Mm -hmm. You remove any one of those, it just starts to dissipate. What does it say? Mm -hmm. I I believe it's in Peter Timothy when it says, if if you break one law, you're guilty of breaking them all, right? So you have that problem of, especially 
what he, what he just said. That if you have a king, you'll never be able to own property. You'll never be able to own your land. Yeah. It's impossible, just like America. And so, like, and, and I'm saying America now. We're supposed to be the freest nation on earth, but you never really own your property once you pay off your house. Don't, don't pay your property tax. Don't pay your property tax, happens. which is yeah. only what, in, in, like in our area, is like 4000 a year. Yeah. Right? They'll come and remove your property. Yeah. Because I don't want to pay a tax. You. <laughs> you know what I mean? So what, was America meant to be set up that way? Was that kind of what the, the founders envisioned, was to be free and just own your land and, 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 and work freely, be you, worship the God of, you know, worship God, the creator, the way you want to worship him, basically. Right. So America's founders looked back to ancient Israel. And uh, just a couple more unusual facts about ancient Israel that I think the viewers will find interesting. And then I'll, I want to answer your uh, question a little bit more clearly. So Israel was the first nation where people could own weapons. Huh. No, wherever, really? wherever there's a king, the king has an army to enforce his will. The common people are disarmed. Yeah. In ancient Israel, every man was in the militia and armed with a sword upon their thigh, and they were ready at a moment's notice to defend their family and their community. Israel also had a bureaucracy-free welfare system. What's that? Well, in Egypt, people were selling their souls to the Pharaoh for a handout of grain. Mm -hmm. In Israel, when somebody harvested their field, they left the gleanings, the corners of the field, for the poor people to pick through. Like Ruth, this way the poor were taken care of without some political leader collecting everything and doling it back out to those who can help them stay in power. And there had to be some effort in that. You, right, you kept you, your dignity. Yeah, you did something. You had to work. You you were picking in the field in order to get your food. Yeah, you know, which that's different from just receiving I a check. That's Deuteronomy you know? nineteen or Leviticus. 19, I think it's Deuteronomy nineteen is when he said that. Yeah. They give him that command. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting because it, it, the psychological aspect of that is if somebody uh, doesn't do anything and they get money, it makes them feel worthless. Yeah. And then they end wow. up hating the person that gives them the feeling of worthlessness. So they actually despise the person that is generous. Hmm. And so that's the dynamic. Ah, yeah, that's a of good it. point. And so, uh, so if they do something, they said like in the Appalachians, yeah. when the th Depression happened, the government was wanting to give money to the poor people, but they wouldn't take a handout. And so they were starving. And so they figured out that... It, if they had them exchange a cabbage, which you know is growing on the ground, mm -hmm. then they would give them the money and the food, and they they would take it because they gave something. Yeah, and they then, did something for it. And then they didn't need the cabbages, so they dig a ditch in the backyard and just throw them all in there and let them <laughs> run. But the people, they felt like they had to give something in order to get something because of that that uh, Judeo Christian work ethic. Um, but but anyway, so here's ancient Israel. Um, they are. The first nation with no police. Everyone was taught the law. Everyone helped enforce the law. It was like everybody was deputized. We have a little of that today with the traffic laws. Sometimes we've been in and out of the lanes. You take it upon yourself to honk the horn. Yeah. Or maybe a mom watching a bunch of neighbors. Even citizens' arrest, right? Like you can do a citizens' arrest. The sheriff had told us that uh, a few years ago when we were in Minnesota. He said, You kind of have almost the same authority I do. You can arrest somebody who breaks the law and wait until we come. He goes, yeah. I just have a badge, basically. That's, I'm deputized, right? Mm -hmm. But we are all deputized, in a sense, in America. So in, in ancient Israel, it was really clear that way. It's sort of like a mom watching a bunch of neighborhood kids. She has no problem correcting somebody else's kid. In Israel, everybody corrected everybody else. It was a self-policing system. Israel had no prisons. Everyone was taught the law. I mean, you look at ancient Israel. Uh, ancient Egypt. Joseph was in prison in ancient Egypt for about three years. And, um, but in Israel, when a crime was committed, you got the elders of the city together and you had the trial immediately. And then, of course, there was a city refuge you could run away to to await yeah. the trial. So Israel was a citizen-dependent model. But you needed to have an educated populace. Because if the people are the king, and people are, they need to be educated. So Israel was the first nation where people could read. I found it fascinating. Really? In Sumeria, those cuneiform characters, yeah. there were about 1,500 different cuneiform characters, but it was only for kings and scribes. Yeah. Writing was just an account, it started as an accounting method for kings. So the first invention ever was the plow. Cain was a tiller of the soil. And then people started hitting each other with it. They turned into weapons. <laughs> 
and then people would gravitate together for protection, and somebody knew how to fight a little better than the rest, and you would say, you be our king or our captain. No. And it's good. You survive. That's a good thing. But then this, this captain would have kids and grandkids who would claim to be an elite class, a, uh, you know, the deep state, the political boss. No. And then before you know it, you got this king. And, and so kings wanted to, to claim to own everything in town, and they wanted to count it. So in China, they developed a way of counting with knots in ropes and then an abacus with rods and beads that you would slide back and forth. Yeah. And then in Sumeria, it was tokens and dishes. And then they made markings in the token. Have you, have you ever tallied where you draw the lines one, two, three, four, the line across for five? That was the beginning of writing. It was like a tallying method to keep track of everything the king owned. Hmm. And um, so Sumeria had 1,500 cuneiform characters, and the common people didn't. didn't yeah. And then in Egypt, they had 3,000 hieroglyphic characters. Again, only 1% of Egypt could read. Reading and writing was the scribe's secret knowledge. They kept the hieroglyphs complicated on purpose as job security. And then in China, they had 10,000 characters, but only for court records. When Moses comes down the mountain, he does not just have the law. He has the law in 22 characters. First character is Aleph, second letter Beth. Sound familiar? So Israel, it was so easy, 22 little characters, so easy to learn. Kids could learn it. Israel was the first nation with a literate populace where everyone could read. Wow. And so uh, then Israel got to choose their own leaders over their different you know, tribes and towns. And, yeah, yeah. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, how can I alone bear your burden? Take you wise men and understanding and known among your tribes, and I'll make them rulers over you. This was an election process within the tribe. You know, right? This yeah. person, we, he hates covetousness, and we said, Moses, this is the one we pick. And, and so... Um, so you look at ancient Israel, it's this unique model. Yeah. And so if, it's a, if you can imagine power as a line with one side total government and the other side no government. Total government, you get a king, he rules through fear. You do what he says or he kills you. The other side is no government. That would be anarchy. No government unless each person is taught the law. It was like everybody downloads a behavioral app on their iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a GPS telling you where to turn, tells you how to act. Be nice to that person. Don't steal that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then the Levites are the computer geeks that help you to download the app. All right, press this button, memorize this first, right? right? Yeah. And so uh, what Israel was doing was counter human nature. It's like each kid is born with this selfishness. And they would, if you ever, imagine every computer you buy is preloaded with a virus. You immediately take it over to the Geek Squad desk and yeah. clean this virus off. Every kid is born preloaded with the virus of selfishness. And the, the Israelites would take him to the Levite and say, recode this kid. You know? <laughs> but the question is, why would you follow? What, what would cause you to follow an internal moral? To deny yourself yielding to a temptation. What, what would cause you to be able to say, no, I'm not going to yield to that? Ancient Israel introduce the key ingredient. There is a God who's watching everyone. He wants you to be fair, and he's going to hold you accountable in the future. So there, there, there wasn't real indication of consequence from higher authority before Israel came in? No, before it was fear of God. I mean, fear of the, the, the Pharaoh. Fear, fear of the, of the king, fear of the sultan. So more fear of humans as opposed to divine authority. Uh, so like yeah. the, the Egyptian gods, there, there wasn't a sense of sin against those gods. It was more of a... a yeah, they were capricious gods. Yeah. And, and you would op- you'd constantly be offending them, and you didn't know what you did to offend them, and so you would give sacrifices, and it was all the superstition. Um, but it wasn't the, 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 the law cause and effect. Okay, there wasn't a consistency You never had a personal relationship yeah. with Ra, the sun god, or something yeah. like that. Um, it was always a uh, distant fear. In Israel, each person had this individual relationship with God. They were taught God's law, and even if nobody was around and they had the opportunity to steal, and they know they could get away with it, and then they would think, God is watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's going to hold me accountable. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. And so that creates something in your head called the conscience. Yeah, integrity too, yeah. And so you take the power of the king, you separate it into the hands of the people. It's chaos, unless the people have been taught the law, but what motivates them to follow the law is this God of the Bible. Now, to your, your question, it only works with the God of the Bible. An Islamic Allah God 
says, there's an infidel woman there. Nobody's around. You can rape her. It's okay. You can lie to this infidel, steal from that infidel. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, you know, the other cultures, like in, in, in the Hindu, you know, oh, that's a Dalit. It's an untouchable in the lowest caste. You can treat them like trash. And, this other, you know. and, and so they didn't have the concept that everyone's equal. And yeah. God wants to treat each person because there's no respect of persons. And, and so, so Israel's system worked for 400 years until the priests stopped teaching it. Mm -hmm. And there's th three stories. One is Eli, the high priest. His own sons are sleeping with women in the very tent of meeting. Here's the tent with the Ark of the Covenant in it, and they're sleeping with women. He's not teaching the law to his own kids. Another story, a Levite with a silver graven image in the house of a guy named Micah, and the tribe of Dan comes along and steals the graven image and tells his priest, come along with us. You can be a priest to our, to our whole tribe. And he goes along with him, and you're scratching your head thinking, what's this Levite doing with the silver graven image? Isn't that like one of the commandments? You're not supposed to have graven yeah. images. It shows that the Levites weren't following the law, much less teaching it. And then the last terrible story is a Levite with a concubine. The law says the Levite is to marry a virgin of his own tribe. Here he is he's with a woman he's not even married to. And they're traveling. They're at a house surrounded by sodomites. Something about that behavior that appears at the very last stages of a people ruling themselves. This casting off of internal restraints. And they bang on the door. The poor, poor girl gets raped and dies. And by the time you're grossed out, you read this line, every man did that which was right in their own eyes. Why? Because the priests had stopped teaching them what was right in the Lord's eyes. They lost the fear of God. They forgot the law. All they had left was their selfish human passions. And it's like taking a bobber off a fishing line. The lead weight hits the bottom of the lake. They begin to rob and steal and kill and all the sexual immorality it turns into chaos. And then finally, the people go to Samuel the prophet and they say, this self-government system's not working anymore. We want to be like all the other countries. We want a king. And Samuel cries, and the Lord tells him, they did not reject you. They rejected me. Yeah, but even then, it's like the self-government isn't working. It's like, you weren't self-governing. You weren't doing it, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, that, it's kind of that cry today of people when, like, a tragedy happens. I'm kind of just equating it. Mm -hmm. You know, we were down in Parkland. I lived, like, an hour from the Parkland shooting that happened last year, I believe it was. And a friend of mine called me, and he's, he's a new Christian, and he had said, Massey, you know, you got you to gotta answer this, man. I hope you have an answer for this. You know, if God... Is so good, like y'all claim, like, why does he allow these things to happen? I was like, you know, it's funny. We put God on the on the chopping block, per se. We put him as the judge, but we never question why he gave a law. You know what I mean? We always put him as the, the, the reasons of doing bad, but we don't ever author him as the reasons of being good. And I said, so if, if God, if you say that God allowed it, right, then what did God say to prevent it? That's what we're not following, right? So we're putting God on the chopping block when he's saying to us, it's you that, that's committed this wickedness. You're the ones that have allowed the, the Ten Commandments not being taught in public schools, which they used to be, which I still find hilarious that people would say, you know, we shouldn't have Ten Commandments in public schools. But it's like for 200 years we were doing it. Either our founders were stupid and they didn't understand separation of church and state, or they actually knew that if we taught the law like the way, uh, who was it? Um, boy, I lost it. Right? Webster. Noah Webster would talk about if we don't have the Bible, it's basically going to, we're going to turn into a despotic nation, you know? Yeah. And it wasn't just him that said that it was John Jay. It was Benjamin Rush. It was all these guys. And it was, there was something about the law of God that it was just like, they knew without internal restraints, this government's going to be and basically what Daniel Webster said. There will be anarchy throughout the world. You use that quote, I think in the book as well. Yeah. So you're bringing out some really good points. And uh, John Adams wrote the Constitution for Massachusetts seven years before the U.S. Constitution was written. And he realized that if we're breaking away from the King of England, we need to have a literate populace. He actually put in to the Massachusetts Constitution that the state would lay a tax on everybody to support Protestant teachers of piety, morality, and religion. Wow. So he says, if we're not going to have a king ruling through fear, we have to have the people be educated and moral. And so we need to have the state paying to educate and have morality. Otherwise, it's going to turn to chaos. And uh, Plato, believe it or not, 380 B.C., was commenting on Athens. And he uh, said how if it's a democracy, the people need to have virtue. Yeah. And, uh, but he says really they don't have virtue because if you give people the choice of giving up their life or giving up their virtue, they'll always give up their virtue to save their life. <laughs> they really don't have it. True. So it's just a matter of time before they're, you know, you people say, well, I know somebody, and, 
and they're a good moral person, but they don't believe in God. It's like, right. yeah, give them the choice of keeping their good moral stuff or saving their life. Yep. And they'll let go of their good moral stuff because, to save their life. The only, Plato says uh, the only way to prove that you really believe this good moral stuff, you know, virtue, is if you chose to die rather than giving up your virtue. And he said, if anyone ever, ever did that, uh, that, ha- that was born that truly had virtue, the world would be so convicted that, that they would crucify him. This is 380 BC, Plato's Republic, chapter 8 and 9. He said, if anyone that really had virtue was born on the earth, the world would crucify him. <laughs> that 380 years before Jesus? Anyway. That's, so, awesome. oh, that's crazy. So Plato understood that if you take the power of the king, separate it into the hands of the people, the people need to rule themselves. Ancient Greece didn't have God. Yeah. Right. He just had being virtuous for virtuous' sake. And he said, this, this satellite's going to crash back down. Gravity's going to pull it down. In Israel's oh. case, they had a big magnet in the sky called God. Yeah. Who's watching you, once you to be fair, going to hold you accountable. And so Israel's experiment lasted a little bit longer. But even then, that satellite eventually yeah. crashed. And, um, but America's founders looked back to that as a model of us having self-rule. We're breaking away from the most powerful king on the planet, ruling from top down. We're going to be ruling ourselves from the bottom up. We need to teach the people the law, and we need to have this country under yeah. God. And so that's the, the model that our founders had. And that uh, something that you caught me with is Greece was very much a logic, philosophical, reason-based society. So you can logic yourself out of virtue if you take long enough time, right? You, you can walk yourself out of virtue into why this would be good to sustain myself. Saul did it all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, made made this reasoning as to why, oh, it's okay now. Whereas Israel, you had written foundational texts. You had written foundational principles to go by. So you have these things that you have to look back and weigh yourself against instead right, right. of using just pure logic and philosophy. So I think that that points to why Israel was able to last a little bit longer under their own rule, their own system, was because they had these foundational texts. Now, to tie that into America, we're getting rid of the foundational texts. Not only just getting rid of the Ten Commandments out of the churches, but we're now saying, well, the Constitution is whatever we want to make it. It's a living, breathing document. And I think that's a a really bad warning sign that we're losing the foundation, the, the foundation upon which to build. We're, we're destroying that and then going with our logic and reason, which gets swayed by the winds of culture and society. And let alone the fact that we're losing the foundation of biblical principle, right? We, we're, we've turned the light off and then we wonder why we can't see. walk the path. Yeah, we can't, we see. can't see, yeah. You know, and, and it just, I love that you decided to go back and look at the history of all of this. And you kind of did you know? what John Adams did. You know that, what is it, the the uh, the defense of the U.S. Constitution? He kind of did that. He was yeah. like, why are all these countries, some good, some despotic, some whatever, and he said basically because they were all democracies. You know, he whether it was, they never believed in, like, they never talked socialism, Marxism, Leninism, yeah. isms, communism. It was all democracies to them. And every time he would say there's a democracy, they'd it'd kill themselves, basically waste itself and commit suicide, right? And so it's funny because, like, the, when he did that, he defended the U.S. Constitution. He was saying, this is why we basically have the best system that we can make. And in order to form a more perfect union, we had to go this far. And then you mm-hmm. can amend it to suit basically what's going on in America. The problem is, and, and this is always a question I've always had, can you amend against the Constitution that, you know what I mean, that it's yeah. already written? And that's kind of what we've done, in a sense, is, is create bills that attack the Constitution rather than exemplify it and lift it up. Does that make sense? It, it does. We've seen a rubber band snapping back into the hands of a king. Yes. And I actually uh, talk about that in the book as well. Uh, the, for example, 500 years ago, Italy was a bunch of city-states. Venice, Genoa, Naples, Florence, Siena, and they always fought. And Machiavelli thought if one prince could control all of Italy, all these city-states, it would stop the infighting. So his end was good. 
And so he said, any means necessary to get there is justified. The ends justifies the means. So um, if a king or a prince conquered a city in his quest to unify Italy, the people would hate him. But if the prince paid criminals to kill cows and burn barns and create crisis and terror, the people would cry out for help. The prince would come in and kill the very criminals he bribed. Nobody would know the better for it, and everyone would praise the prince as a hero. So it's good marketing. Jeez. You create the need and fill you it. You hearing this? You go around the back of the this? house. <laughs> go around the back of the house, set it on fire. Then you go around the front of the house and sell them a fire extinguisher, and they'll pay anything for it and even thank you for being there. So it's called Machiavellianism, where you create or capitalize on a crisis to consolidate control. So in times of crises, Bro. people will, will knee-jerk reaction, surrender their freedoms to, to somebody that's promising to restore security, and that the rubber band snaps back. And you hearing this? Because that's what happens. Gun control. Someone's a big old thing, and all of a sudden, oh, we got to give up gun control. And then they use these crazy statistics, like 91% of the people are for gun control. It's like, yeah, you took a poll of 1,200 people probably downtown Chicago. You know what I mean? that's kind of what happens now. It's like whenever a crisis happens, there's the big government ready to get, we're going to bring order and restore it. We just have to give up your liberty. No big right. deal. And so that um, Machiavelli's idea influenced someone in Germany in the early 1800s named Hegel, H-E-G-E-L. Mm -hmm. And Hegel basically turned it into a triangle, a thesis on one corner, an antithesis or antithesis on the opposite corner, and then on top, it's a synthesis. Sounds complicated, but it's not. You start off at the thesis, you create the antithesis. In other words, you create a crisis that's really bad, and then everybody's happy to settle for your answer that's half as bad. Then this synthesis becomes a new thesis, and then you create another problem that's real bad, and everybody's happy to settle for your answer that's half as bad. And you keep creating crisis and crisis each time people surrender a little more freedom, and you move across the page from the people ruling themselves from the bottom up all the way to a king ruling from the top down. Yeah. And so this Hegelian dialectics was adopted by Karl Marx. And he says, how do you create the antithesis? Um, you send in agitators, agent provocateurs, provoking agents, community organizers, labor organizers, and their goal is to find people with grievances and you stir them up, and you say, you've been wronged, you want what they have, follow me, you'll get it, and you end up creating um, uh, riots, and then people, uh, in the insecurity that follows, everybody's willing to say, Tch, whatever the government takes to restore order. And then the government takes away your guns and takes away your rights. 45 countries felt the communist dictators this way. And so they would organize the proletariat versus the bourgeois, which is the working mm -hmm. class against the business owners. They would organize the blacks against the whites, the Catholics against the, the, you know, the Protestants, Protestants, the Muslims against the Christians, the Hutus against the Tutsis in the Congo and Rwanda. They really don't care who the two sides are. They just want to stir up a crisis, and then when it gets out of hand and everybody feels insecure, everybody's willing to surrender their freedoms to somebody promising to restore order, and the rubber band snaps back and you get a king. And believe it or not, this is how the British took over India. Hundreds of kingdoms, they reached an equilibrium for centuries. Britain comes in and gives one kingdom guns, gives another kingdom guns, stirs up ancient animosity so they fight each other, and then Britain comes in and conquers both. And they do this again and again and again until they took over all of India. They tried doing it in America, where they came in and gave guns to the Indians and said, look, if you scalp the Americans on the frontiers, you know, we'll... we'll and so we end up seeing this intentional story, and this is what the, uh, the KGB would do. Mm -hmm. Come into countries, yeah. find people with grievances. I hate to admit it, but uh, Eisenhower approved the uh, overthrowing of the president in Iran, Mossadegh. It was called Operation Ajax because he was leaning toward the Soviet Union. No. And so this was the first plan where our CIA went into Iran, found people who had grievances against Mossadegh, stirred them up, gave them guns, right, and then they threw them out and we installed the Shah. And so uh, basically... We are today experiencing these tactics done on our own soil yeah. that have been done on other countries' soil. So people are coming into neighborhoods, finding people with grievances, stirring them up, bringing about riots and so forth. And then in the confusion, they're saying, we need the government to come in and take away everybody's freedoms, everybody's guns, everybody's rights. You can't speak if it offends somebody. You gotta, and before you know it, um, their goal is to have power go from the people into the hands of a dictator. I feel like we've been experiencing a reprieve from that agenda being implemented, but they're chomping at the bit. 
And if they had the chance, boom, I could see more crises and more usurping of power and uh, a lot of the freedoms, you know, we saw recently in, um, in New Zealand, yeah. a killing and what happened immediately, the country disarms itself. It's like, okay, you do know that China is not very far away, yeah. and you do know that New Zealand does not have any army or navy to speak of. It's just <laughs> a populace, and you're, you know, there's a bigger picture here than just what you're involved in. And, and there was a movement to censorship right away. Uh, there's people who are facing like 14 years in prison for merely sharing the video of the shooting. And this, this was a total knee-jerk reaction from the New Zealand government that, okay, it's now outlawed for you to share the video or to post a link to it or you know to to uphold it or anything yeah. if you do this and and there are a couple of people who are actually facing significant jail time it's that crisis that's taken advantage of in a second you know let alone the disarmament you know, movement to okay we don't need guns we don't want any protection. <laughs> yeah, and so if you look at, uh, David Horowitz said, the issue is never the issue, the issue is always the revolution. So it, it has nothing to do with Confederate flags, Confederate statues, Pledge of Allegiance, kneeling during the pledge, uh, you know, the anti-Trump, the hands up, don't shoot, the quiet spaces on the campuses, you know, it, it, the, oper the operation, or was it uh, Occupy Wall Street, all of those instances, it, it's really not those instances it's the bigger goal of stirring up the agenda yeah uh, a disruption domestically when there's soon as there's enough fear and enough insecurity for life and property then everybody's going to be begging for some strong government power to come in and and they'll happily surrender their freedoms but then the dust settles and they realize that they transition their form of government instead of bottom up ruled by the people it's now ruled top down by a bureaucratic state that's basically uh, a bunch of government employees that want to keep their jobs. <laughs> and then on top of that, you have a political boss. And then, you know, that's basically the dictator. And um, your life is only of value if you serve the party. That's the party that's in power. Yeah. And that's the way every pyramid structure to society is. Um, and um, uh, so whether you call it a king or a dictator or, you know, uh, El Presidente or a Chairman Mao... I mean, here he's responsible for 80 million people being killed, you know, or Pol, Pot and, Pol Pot killed a third of Cambodia. Um, you know, and you have Mao Tse Tung. And, and they Ho did Chi it while Min. going to sleep at night, Bill. They did it. Go, they, they would go to sleep at night. If doing there's this. no consciousness of God, <clears throat> and that's what Solinsky said. You can defeat the Christians because they're limited by something called morals. And he says, your only moral is winning, is your agenda. And you're convinced your agenda is good, then any means necessary to get there is justified. Lie, cheat, steal, knock off a few people, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I mean, you sort of think of it. If your party platform includes killing innocent children. Pat, uh, to the nine-month mark, yeah. Is there anything that you can't mentally justify that you can't do? If, you're, if your platform says to kill innocent children, is there anything that's certainly a little voter fraud you know, here and there, you know, is it can be justified yeah. if you can justify killing innocent children. So, um, so we're facing a um, a situation. So once we get rid of a fear of an awareness of God, right? Then it's just man-made laws, whatever the group agrees upon, social contract, right? And um, and then it's going to eventually turn into chaos. And then out of that chaos, you're going to want. Uh, uh, order restored, security to come back, somebody's got to stop the random killing, and then the rubber band snaps back and you get a king. Uh, so when you study history and you see things repeating themselves, it, I tell people history is not prophetic, but it is predictive. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. past behavior is the best indicator of future performance. So... Um, so anyway, there's more there, but... No, there is. And so kind of... One of the reasons I wanted to talk about this book specifically is because I've been through like three of the presentations that he did, and I took down a bunch of notes. And the, the there was there was always one theme at the end. So how does the citizen understand his role, and how does he apply it? Right. So I got convicted earlier this year. That's why I started getting involved more locally in 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 Florida, in in the city, in the county, was because I just felt God telling me you can't preach nationally what you're not willing to practice locally. 
Like you have to, there's got to be a balance. So like if you're going to preach it nationally saying limited government, all these things, but if your city still, you know, learn how to do both. And so I just really felt this conviction of we're the king, you know, like they, they work for us and, and it's our taxes that pay them. And, and I, if I don't have a say, then I'm no longer under a, a, a limited government. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, we, we brought this up last podcast. A limited government doesn't run up to $22 trillion of debt. That's not a responsible government, right? Because that, that wouldn't work with us. If we just rang up debt, eventually we get thrown in jail for some kind of a fraud. Someone would say, wait a minute here. You know what I mean? They're, they're getting mad at companies for actually being successful now. Too much success is too much, and that's, that's bad. You know, you're immoral for having too much. But if I had too little and I was going into debt, that's too, you know what I mean? It's immoral. So how do the people apply being the king? Does that make sense of the question? All right. So uh, kings have subjects who are subjected to their will. Uh, Democracies and republics have citizens. The word citizen is Greek. It means co-king, co-regent, co-ruler, co-sovereign. So we're all citizens of of America. We're all co-kings of America. And uh, so so we pledge allegiance to the flag. We're basically pledging allegiance to us being in charge of ourselves. (laughs) <laughs> so when somebody protests the flag, what they're saying is, I don't want to be the king anymore. I protest this system where I participate in ruling myself. You know. Yeah. Um, now, democracy is a Greek word. Uh, a matter of fact, politics is a Greek word. Polis means city. Metropolis, Annapolis, Minneapolis, right? Polis means city. And uh, politics is the business of the city. And so, uh, so in a democracy... Everybody in the city had to be at the market every day to talk politics. In Athens, there were about 6,000 citizens, and they met at the market, the agora, and uh, they were the ecclesia. They were, ek means out of, and ecclesia means calling. They were called out of their homes into the public place, and they decided what was going to happen. But if you didn't show up for a couple days, you were called an idiotus, an idiot. You didn't know what was going on. And um, <laughs> so, hey, there you go. <laughs> We're not going to call you an idiot, but get informed. So, a democracy, everybody had to be there. A republic is where you take care of your family and your farm, and you have someone in your place that goes to the market every day. They are your representative. So, you're the king, but you just have representatives that go to the market every day and talk politics. So, the REP in republic is the same REP in representative. <laughs> so uh, the d- democracy, the people are king, but you personally have to be there every day. A republic is you're the king, but you have someone in your place that goes to the market every day. America, we add a little bit to it. We call it a constitutional republic. So our representatives are limited by a bunch of rules, right? So the congressmen are only in for two years, and then the senator six, the president four, and we take the power and we separate it all up. Um, but we're still the king. So Abraham Lincoln said, the people are the rightful masters of both Congresses and courts. And Governor Morris, a signer of the Constitution, said, the magistrate is not the king, the people are the king. John Jay was the first chief justice. He said, the people are the sovereign of this country. So we're the sovereign. So I love the quote from John Jay. He says, um, uh, in this country, your lives, your liberty, your property will be at the disposal only of your creator and yourselves. If I were to sum up the greatness of America, right, make America great again, <laughs> it's that line right there. Your lives, your liberty, your property are at the disposal only of your creator and yourselves. It's just you and God. There's no king in between. There's no government system that says you can't live here. You can't marry that person. You have to wear this burqa dress. You can't eat that food. You know, you got, no, it's just you and your creator and you get to decide. You don't like your career? You can apply yourself, study. You can switch careers, right? You don't like the area of the country you're living in? You can move to another area. Right? You're not limited by the structure. It's just you and your creator. And um, so uh, in America, the people are the king. And uh, we're, you get to be king of your own life. And together, we are all co-kings of America. Right. And if you uh, think of it, imagine back going back in time, and you're going through the streets of Jerusalem, and you're witnessing murder, rape, and crime. And you get into the king's chamber. And he's all worried sitting on his throne. And he looks up at you and he says, did you see all that crime coming in here? I wish someone would fix it. 
and you like reach over and tap him on the shoulder, say, "Excuse me, you're the king. This, this is your kingdom. I think you're the one accountable to God to fix this mess." That's like somebody watching TV or uh, YouTube and, and seeing all the crime happen in the country and seeing all the terrible stuff and saying, I wish somebody would fix it. Hey, have a finger reach through the screen and tap you on the shoulder. You're the king. <laughs> You're the one accountable to God to fix this mess. Well, I need somebody to tell me what to do. Since when does the king sit on his throne and say, can somebody tell me what I'm supposed to do? Hey, hey, Butler, come here. What am I supposed to do? No, it's your job to get educated on the issues, seek God's will, and you tell your representatives what needs to happen. You're the king. Now, one of the things I found interesting, so in America, the people are the king. Yeah. Pew Forum, P-E-W, they do surveys. They said that 70% of Americans are Christian. Now, this is 2014. I've been keeping track of the number for 30 years. Back 30 years ago, it was 96% of the country identified as Christian. Then it went down to 90, then it went down to 85, then it went down to 80, it's down to 70, and the surveys show it's still going down. Mm -hmm. That is not a good thing. But as of 2014, 70% of the country identified itself as Christian. 70%, that, that's a majority. They could turn any election any way they wanted. And since they identify as Christians, that means they go to church, at least yeah. every now and then which makes the pastors counselors to the king. Now, I'm looking at pictures. There's this old photo. That's uh, good. There's a painting of a Roman emperor, Theodosius. He lived 379 A.D. He's a Christian. So we got 313 A.D., Constantine stops the persecution of Christians. The Roman Empire becomes Christian. So now we're up to 379. There's a Christian Roman emperor, Theodosius. He's going to church in Milan, Italy, and the pastor is St. Ambrose. Could you imagine being St. Ambrose and having the Roman emperor sitting in your church <laughs> on Sunday? Well, guess what? That's exactly what we have in America. So 70% of the people are Christian, and they're sitting in a church pew. And the pastor has the king sitting in the, in the church pew. And you have two kinds of pastors. One tells the king to go to sleep, shirk your responsibility, don't get involved, be negligent, just let whatever happens, happens. And another one says, wake up. Now, I love the movie The Lord of the Rings. And the one scene in there captures this concept. There's a King Theodon, and he has a spell cast on him. He's got gray hair, gray eyes, got cataracts. He's decrepit and in his throne. And he has two counselors in this scene. One is this greasy guy named Wormtongue. And he's whispering in the king's ear, saying, stay asleep, don't get involved. Yeah, your kingdom's being mm -hmm. overrun, but just wait a little longer, and it's all going to be over. And there's another counselor to the king named Gandalf, and he, like, cast the devil out of the king. And, like, right before your eyes, the king starts to come, too. And he looks around the room, and his hair goes from gray to brown, and it gets short, and his eyes go from cloudy to clear. And he looks around, and he says, dark have been my dreams of late. It's like, yeah, you've been out of it with the spell cast on you. And they said, maybe you'll remember your strength if you take your sword. And he wakes up. And so there's two counselors. One tells the king in the pew, uh, go to sleep. Don't care about what happens. Just remove yourself and be a negligent. Right? Another one, pastor throws ice water on his congregation. He says, wake up. You don't just have the right to vote in America. You will be held accountable to God for what happens in America. If they're killing little babies... God's going to hold you accountable. Amen. If yeah. they're teaching stuff to little kids that Jesus wouldn't teach to little kids. Jesus says, if you cause one of these little ones that believes in me to stumble better than a millstone be put around your neck, then they're teaching little kids. So we're the king. We're allowing them to implement this yeah. agenda, saying, well, if there is a God, he's so messed up, he's put in men and women's bodies, and you have to have operations to fix it. And I'm made in the image of this messed up God. And if that behavior is not a sin, arguably there are no sins. And their tactic is to guilt trip Christians into being more Christian than Christ. You think what? They're, oh, if you're really Christian, you'll tolerate this agenda being taught to yeah. kids. Question, would Jesus teach that to little kids? Jesus says, in the beginning, God made them male and female. The man shall leave the father and mother, cleave to his wife. Jesus wouldn't teach that stuff. Oh, you could feel like a girl today, boy tomorrow. And so their, their tactic is if you're really Christian, you won't act like Christ. It's, it's a tactic of wow. love is acceptance. Love is promotion, right? That and, you know, God isn't the author of confusion. 
That's yeah. what's been happening is, you know, if we just let them, we'll be at peace through confusion. That's kind of what's been happening over the, I would say, boy, since, well, since I've been alive, you know, I didn't wake up. I, I find it, I, I get this question a lot. Like, why do you, why do you, why do you put so much effort into this? And, and you never stop. I get it a lot, <laughs> you know, and it's like something happened when I woke up and there's a, there's a scripture, I believe it's in Ecclesiastes, where it said, when, with much knowledge cometh much sorrow. The more I know, the more I can undo in what I see. You know, it's like if I see babies being aborted, why ain't I out there at these Planned Parenthoods rescuing these women from the enemy? Why aren't we out evangelizing on the streets, rescuing these souls from the enemy? Why aren't we, uh, you know, every two hours a kid in this country commits suicide? Why aren't we going out and doing this, being in the schools that we pay for, reaching out to these students? Why aren't we going to the colleges and where, where literally the rubber meets the road, literally where they're telling kids you can't be Christian, they'll fail you if you do a Christian paper. How can I rest? How, like, how can I stop? How can I, how can I not do? I'm not saying I do it out of works. I'm saying that there's always this constant, there, there has to be a push in you that, that it's a spiritual thing. Like, why would I waste my life for this? Because God ordained us to do this. It's not just me either. There's many of us that maybe can't talk like a bill, that can't talk like me or, or study like you and teach like you, right? But we can all do something. And that's the king. Like, what can we do to influence our sphere around us? Which is what kings do. They influence mm-hmm. spheres. They're influential, right? Because we want to go to that king and say, man, like, I, I'm under that kingdom. That's cool, man. I like that. That's why I, I believe the motto, and it's, it's, it's only attributed to, to Adams and a couple others they, when they said no king but King Jesus. The king that we served was Christ. That's it, right? If we serve Christ, isn't there a love in you that compels you to go reach as he loved you? That, see, you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that, I can't see how we can sit down and not go into these places. I, 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 I don't understand. And maybe that's, you know, something that we got to continue to teach. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm off or maybe I'm off base. But, you know, how long have you been teaching this kind of stuff? Well, my first book came off the press in 1994. So it's been a while. But, you know, I've, that, that circle I mentioned at the beginning, that Fibonacci sequence, that golden ratio, mm-hmm. that five, that increasing of it, clearly there's a global goal in mind. And ultimately that same sin of Cain, you know, Adam and Eve and Cain kill and Abel is going to magnify the, to the Antichrist. Yep. But that book of the Bible sort of left in God's domain, all the timing of it, everything is going to take, but he's going to, you know, I can't, I'm not going to change it. It's, he's going to do that. I'm just responsible to respond to the crises that's in my lifetime. And when you look at every single generation has had crises. Uh, Attila the Hun, they thought he was the Antichrist. He's killed, he has an army of a half a million men. He's wiping out millions of people in Europe. The bubonic plague, Genghis Khan, you know, Mao Zedong's communist. Every generation has crises. And it, it, the crises is an opportunity for people to respond. They can either ignore the crises, they can be on the bad side of it, or they can try to remedy it. It gives you an opportunity to let God use you to be the answer to the problem. Mm -hmm. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And so it's sort of like the, the, the wicked seed, the tear of Adam and Eve sinning and Cain killing Abel that turns into the Nimrod Tower of Babel, ultimately the Antichrist, the righteous seed. Uh, eventually is going to... So Jesus says the wheat and tares grow together to yeah. the harvest. But we're just responsible to respond to the crises that's in our generation. That's right. And um, so I, I heard somebody say there's three groups of people. Those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those that wonder what happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And so, <laughs> and so our, our job is to be on the front lines and make things happen and be a force for righteousness and whatever happens in that last chapter, we're not going to do it, but we're, we're just responsible, responsible yeah. to, to respond within our lifetime. And um, anyway... You, uh, you, I, you, you do... Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I know I've said this before, we're the salt of the earth, right? True. So we, we have the strength and authority to, to do it. hold off decay, or at least slow the decay down, right? And salt is a preservative. We're, we're here to preserve. Um, and one of the things that I just wanted to put in is you guys were talking a lot about the the effort put forward or or the belief that you can and I think something that we need to get back as a nation is the responsibility to the community um, we're a very passive society more and more we're very passive in how our 
how we interact with our government, how we interact with those around us. It's very much now more and more, what can the government do to take care of me or take care of him or take care of her? I'll give the government money. They'll take care of that person so I don't have to worry about it. The, the idea of a citizen, like you were saying, was a role. It was a responsibility. And if you weren't there for a couple of days, you were considered an idiot because you were out of, out of the loop on it. Well, you need to be in the loop because you need to have a responsibility to your community yeah. to make sure things are still going properly. And I think one of our jobs that, that we all take very seriously on the front lines is getting people to understand you still have responsibility to your community. Now step up. You know, you know um, five different groups God gives commands to. He gives commands to individuals and then to families and then to employer employees and then to church and then to government. The commands to the individual include care for the poor, turn the other cheek, walk the extra mm -hmm. mile, you know, love your enemies, uh, be charitable. There's no command for the family to be charitable. The command to the family is husbands, love your wives, kids, submit to your parents, yeah. right? The employers are supposed to not withhold the wages and the employee to give an honest day's work. The church, it's commanded to take care of the poor, have or feed the orphans and the widows and everything. The government's command is the shortest, protect the innocent, punish the guilty. What we've seen is the church has neglected doing the commands and the government usurping. You go through history, the church started hospitals. You go back, mm -hmm. you know, the Syrians had... Uh, hospitals, the, the Christian Syrians. The, the, the Syrians were the most Christian country in the world for like six centuries until the Muslims conquered them. But they invented medical schools and hospitals. And, and then Constantine, the consul of Nicaea, said every cathedral had to have an infirmary. <laughs> and that was the beginning of hospitals. And then there was the bubonic plague, and nobody wanted to bury the dead bodies. The election brothers, Catholics, they, in the 1300s, they gave Christian burials, but then people didn't die right away, so they'd take care of them, sort of hospice, but then they yeah. would recover, and then they would be generous and give back to the election brothers, and, um, and then it started the uh, Hotel de you. The word hotel means uh, traveler and of God, and so they would have these nuns, the Sisters of Charity of St. Vincent and everything, and they would start these hospitals all across Europe, there were orders of nuns that would follow behind the armies, taking care of the, the dying and the, and the and wounded. Um, and then um, uh, in America, uh, you had most, I think, nine out of the ten largest hospital corporations were started uh, out, of the, out of churches and most of them out of the Catholic Church. The university system was started out of the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Um, the, the church, Protestant and Catholic, took care of the poor, the orphans, the, the widows, the shut-ins, the wounded veterans after the Civil War. The church did all of the social programs. Uh, when an immigrant came to America, they were taken care of by their family and by the church. Um, there was no government welfare. The government didn't do those things. The government's job is to protect the innocent, punish the guilty. Um, and so what we have done, because we haven't taught these five things, we say, oh, let's get a Christian government. And the Christian says, oh, we got to take care of the poor. Let's vote for more taxes. So, no, let's cut the taxes and say, go to your church. Yeah. When the early church started, the people sold their property, and they brought the money to the feet of the apostles. They didn't bring it to the feet of Pilate. Hey, Pilate, I sold my farm. Here's some more money for the Roman Empire to sort of pass around. No, they took it to the field. If you want to, to give, you give to your church and say, please use this money to help the poor. You don't have the government take care of the poor. It is not the government's job to do health care and welfare and all these social programs. It's the church's job. Take the, the, the burdens off of the church and let them go back to doing it. And so, But it starts really subtly. So the, the church has a benevolence ministry and it helps take care of the poor. But it's a little bit of a hassle. And so maybe a bunch of churches say, you know what, let's just pool our resources and, and we'll have a little kitchen set up in the city. And, uh, and so if somebody comes, we'll just all send them there. No. We'll talk, you know, we'll, we won't keep it divisive. We'll just make a sort of general Christian stuff. And then it gets a little bit bigger. And it's like, oh, we want, you know, other people in the community to participate. So we won't even mention God. It'll just be a place to hand out fruit. And then the government comes along under the previous president and says, you know what, we're going to cut the church out of the loop. 
everybody just tell your poor to go there and we'll sign them up to be voters for our particular party mm -hmm. while they're getting the free handouts. And, and so that usurps it gradually. And the church, you know, gave up on it. Willfully, yeah. It, so it surrendered its responsibility and the government usurped it. The problem is any program that's run by the government, it's run by people who want to keep their jobs. And they're going to be tempted to use their position to cause their job to be secure and grow. And they're going to be tempted to want to use their position to shut up anybody that's threatening their job. And that's called the deep state. Mm -hmm. That's called this collective group of individuals that want the government to grow bigger because they see it as mm -hmm. job security. And they do not want people that want to cut the size of government. And so they'll be tempted to want to use their position, especially if they're in the intelligence community, uh, use their position to help leak stuff on the, the opponents that are threatening. And so I was talking when I ran for Congress with somebody who worked for Amtrak. And they talked really how much they disliked the president that was in at the time. And at the end of them saying all this negative stuff about the president, um, he said, it's too bad I'm going to have to vote for him. I go, what? You just got done saying that. <laughs> that he goes, yeah, but, you know, the Republicans, if they get in there, they want to cut all spending. And, and they're, you know, our, my union paper says that, the, that they want to cut Amtrak's uh, money, and so I'm going to lose my job. And so I don't want to, but I'm going to have to vote Democrat. <laughs> it's like Gosh. You, you multiply that, that's the deep state. That's people yeah. saying, you know, I really don't like it, but I got to vote it because I got, I want to keep my job. But then it gets a little bit more. I talked to somebody that worked at the post office. Again, I ran for Congress three times. And they would say, you know, the last week is when you want to have your last mailing. You raise money for it. You print it. You design it. It's your last get-out-the-vote piece. And some people that used to work at the post office told me that uh, if it was a Republican candidate and it was the, uh, the classification of mailing where it would take um, – is the, the least expensive, and, and you have to sort it by zip codes. But um, they would keep it under the desk one extra day. Wow. So that th it would finally hit the day after the election. Wow. And they had this window of when it was acceptable for media mail to, to, to reach. And so, well, it, would, it fell within that window that we did our job. We got it out. Yeah, but you knew what was going on, and you knew. Yeah. That it, it, and so you, you, that's just in one little position. But what if you're in a big position, maybe in some department that has access to all the intelligence community, and <clears> you're yeah. tempted not just to keep it under the desk, but maybe to find some uh, dirt or make up something and leak it in. Yeah. And so we see this entity is called the deep state, and it wants to perpetuate itself. Sure. And it wants to uh, stop anybody threatening it. And that's self-preservation over virtue, right? We we get back to oh yeah, they would getting rid sell of, their virtue before exactly. Their lives. And if you take take a lot of people who they they may think themselves good people, but they go, look, I I got to keep my job. Yeah, no, I, no. I I can't lose my job. I got mouths to feed. And these people want to get rid of my business. Right. Well, <laughs> I mean, what's what's the problem with sliding this under the desk one extra day? Like, I'm I'm just helping keep my job. That's so easy for people to create that compromise and justification you know, in their minds. When a cell splits, what tells the little stuff on this side to go this direction, and the stuff on this side to go this direction? It's just a, it's like a magnet that's just balancing it. And it's that littlest of little, and it's in, inside of each person's heart. Mm -hmm. You know, Alexis, I'm sorry, um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was put in a Russian labor camp for yeah. decades, um, he says that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, that if, you know, evil is not something that we can identify that this group of person has, and this one we can just, you know, cut it out of society. He says it, it runs through the, every person's heart. Every person has the choice right. of whether they're going to say, well, I'm going to vote for what's best for my pocketbook, or I'm going to vote for, for pro-life, mm -hmm. and I'm going to take a moral stand, and I'm going to trust God for the difference. That's right. Every person, every day, makes these choices. And I believe that the crisis is an opportunity. It's a, div it's a splitting, that take, and it's the Lord allowing this so that we can reveal what's in each of our hearts, so that it, we're the ones that are sorting it yeah. out. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know? So I got a question. You end you know, almost every presentation with this like analogy about heaven, 
about what's your story. Can you do that? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, the, the, b- before I do, the, there's a, a quick way to explain the gospel. And um, uh, the idea is uh, Adam and Eve sinned and they hid from God. So have you ever sinned against anybody? You sort of don't want to be around the person you've sinned against. Hmm. Let's say we're talking about somebody behind their back. We're making fun of them. And we look up and there's that very person and they're walking towards us. They're walking toward you. Question, are you drawn to want to go over and talk to that person? Or are you like, oh man, I was just, I was just slamming them behind their back and they're walking. <laughs> I feel really uncomfortable. I, I think I'm going to you know, go to the restroom out the back door. Your own conscience does not want you to be around the person you've sinned against. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, God still wanted to walk in the garden with them, but they're the ones that wanted to get away. Hmm. So it's like two magnets that are stuck together and one of them turns. The first one wants to touch, but the second one wants to get away. Yep. So it's not so much that God sends people to hell. It's once people sin against God, their own conscience won't let them come into his presence. The closer they get, the more they're aware of their sin, the more awkward they feel. You know, tell people, you know, if you're doing a good job at work, your boss comes by and says, hey, I want to see you in my office. Like, oh, okay. But if you've been stealing and <laughs> pilfering and <laughs> taking long lunches, yep. you know, and all kinds of st- stuff missing, and the, the boss comes by and says, hey, I want to see you in my office. Do you want to go into his office? <laughs> no. Yep. Your dun, own dun, conscience dun. does not want you to be around the person you've sinned against. So Adam and Eve sinned. They wanted to get away from God. So they finally said, you know what? We blew it. We, we sinned against God. We have to do something to make ourselves acceptable to God. They put on fig leaves. That was the beginning of false religions. Hmm. Man coming up with man's idea how to make man acceptable to God. Did the fig leaves make them acceptable? No. And this little line, God made Adam and Eve coats of skins. Question, how do you make a coat of skin? Kill an animal. Kill an animal. Something has to die. Do you think God went to the other side of the garden, killed an animal, and brought Adam and Eve some nice tailored outfits? No. Or do you think maybe he killed the animal right in front of them? Right in front of them. Made them watch. They witnessed the first death ever. Creation just happened. This is the first thing ever to die. And Adam and Eve are in shock. They're watching this innocent animal go through the pangs of dying. And they're thinking to themselves, we're the ones that sin, but this innocent animal is the one that's dying. And God wanted to make it really clear the animal was dying in their place, that right in front of them, he strips the skin off the animal, and he puts it on their naked bodies. (laughs) Maybe it still had some blood on it. They were covered in the blood. And so for the rest of their lives, they are wearing the skin of that animal that they watched die in their place. And whenever God sees them, he sees them clothed with the skin of the animal the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So Adam and Eve tell Cain and Abel. Cain decides he wants to worship God, but um, he wants to follow the church of the fig leaf. (laughs) He he starts the church of the fruits and the nuts. Cain's is a religion of works. How do we know it's works? Because God told Adam, the ground is cursed for your sake, and you'll bring forth fruit by the sweat of your brow. So here's Cain sweating and working, piling all of his fruit and vegetables on the altar, did his works make him acceptable to God? No. And Abel did the lamb thing. And it's this picture, God's on one side, we're on the other side, our sins separate us from God, and the lamb pays for the sin. So Abel offered lambs, Abraham offered lambs, Moses had every family in Israel kill a lamb, put the blood over the doorpost of the house. And then, um, uh, you know, finally John the Baptist points at Jesus and says, Behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So God's on one side, we're on the other side, our sin separates from God, and the lamb pays for the sin. So I ask people, are you approaching God as Cain or as Abel? If you're still hoping you're good enough to go to heaven, you're approaching God as Cain. I hope I'm, uh, you know, hope I'm good enough, hope I piled enough fruit and vegetables on the altar. You know, maybe another handful of barley will do it. Or are you approaching God as, as Abel? It's not me, it's this lamb that died on the cross to pay for my sins. And then the thought is, why did the lamb have to die? God is a just God. He cannot help it. It's his nature. He has to judge every sin. If he lets a sin slide and doesn't judge it, he's effectively giving consent to the sin. Mm -hmm. Silence equals consent. Remember the old wedding ceremonies where the minister would say, uh, anyone that's against this wedding, speak now or forever hold your peace. 
So if you're holding your peace, you're effectively giving consent to the wedding. If God holds his peace in the face of sin, he's effectively giving consent to the sin, and he's yeah. not going to give consent to sin. He's going to judge it. It's his very nature. That's been implanted in each of us so much that every police drama you see on TV starts off with an injustice done in the first two minutes. Remember NCIS or something? Yeah. The first two minutes, some innocent person's killed. And you're held captive the rest of the hour, wanting the person that did it to be brought to justice. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. And so in the first two minutes of the book of Genesis, an injustice is done. Cain kills Abel. And God says to Cain, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What was it crying? An injustice is done. Innocent guy killed. You're a just God. you got to judge the guy that did it. And so this is the only side of God that the devil knew, the justice side. So here's Satan. He's... Lucifer is a beautiful angel puffed up with pride. He wants to put his throne higher than the throne of God. God says, you've sinned against me, you're out. He goes into the garden. Satan sees Adam and Eve and says, hmm, if I can get them to sin against God one time, God will have to judge them. Gets them to sin, that was easy. And then he says, if you're a just God, you have to judge him. Otherwise, you're giving consent to the sin. So God sends this fireball of judgment, but in steps the lamb and takes the hit. So God is just in that he judges every sin He's love in that he provided the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. And Jesus is the lamb. Jesus, out of love for the Father and out of love for you and me, became the lamb. And so, um, you know, winding it up, but the book of Revelation, it's God that's pouring out the vials of judgment. Yeah. You know, and so you, and the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. And um, the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. And so why is that? Once and for all, for the rest of eternity, God has to judge every sin. So you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there were these sins back then, and you never judged them. Were, were you giving consent to them? No, no, no. He, he makes it clear. He judges every sin. Yeah. And in that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. That's why he was sweating drops of blood. The Bible says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. He experienced that day of judgment as if it was a thousand years. Wow. And if you think of it as a scale, an eternal being who is innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all the finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Wow. Uh, so a finite being, an, an infinite being, right, an eternal being who's right. innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all the finite beings were guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Jesus literally suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places. So that's why we approach God through the Lamb. He's a just God. He has to judge every sin we've ever done, but we approach him through the Lamb, and, the, and like the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the Lamb on the, on the mercy seat, mm -hmm. the blood changed it from a judgment seat into a mercy seat. And oh. so, so we approach God Whoa. through the blood, saying it's all been paid, right? And um, so anyway, that's the gospel story. But... Um, but what you had mentioned, so someday uh, you're going to be dead, but you're going to be in heaven because you believe good. that Jesus died on the cross to pay for all your sins. And when we've been there, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing his praise than when we just begun, if you imagine you've been in heaven 10,000 years and you get a chance to meet Moses, you know, it says in my father's house, so many mansions, maybe Moses will invite you over to his place. I don't know what it's like up there, but... Uh, I bet Moses um, will have a pretty pretty nice place. He, he might even have one of those big fireplaces where the logs don't burn out. <laughs> <laughs> Burning bush in the wilderness, he saw. Out the fireplace didn't burn out. I heard someone say, in heaven, you'll probably be able to travel as fast as you think, and I'll probably show up late. <laughs> and my wife will say, where were you? I'll say, I was thinking about something else. <laughs> but if you can imagine being there, here in Moses' living room, and big table and all the people around it, and... After the small talk's over, you say, Moses, tell us the story again. What was it like? I, I read the book. I even saw the movie. But here you are in person. <laughs> and he'll stand up and he'll say, well, I was 80 years old, and Pharaoh, the most powerful military leader in the world, was charging in at us. We were totally unarmed, and, um, and I just trusted the Lord. It took my staff, and I said, God, use me to deliver your people. And the waves came in and swallowed up Pharaoh's chariots. And we look around the, the table and see David. Say, David, tell us your story. He'll stand up, the room will get quiet, and he'll say, I was just a teenager, and this thug Goliath was mocking our God, and these grown-ups were too chicken to do anything. I said, enough of them. I don't know everything, but I'm going to use my little sling and hit him in the head and chopped his head off. And Then we're going to see Gideon and Samson and Deborah, all the great saints of old around the table. Finally, everyone's going to look at you. So you tell us your story. 
What did you do when it was your turn to be on earth? What were they saying about God in your country or the Ten Commandments or the baby that the Lord knew in the mother's womb or marriage that God himself instituted in Genesis? What did you do when the whole world was against you, right? When they were coming after you and saying bad lying about you, what did you do? You know, I'd hate for any of us to be up there and um, say, gee, uh, can you call on somebody else for a minute? Let me, let me think about this, you know, or maybe Jesus to walk in the room and, uh, and a big screen, to be there and him showing all kinds of great things happening and people come to the Lord, miracles, and him saying, this is what I had planned for you to do. But you just didn't have enough faith and courage. And you look wow. back at your life and see that wow. big mountain of fear and, and intimidation that held you back from doing all those things. And you look back, it was just a little teeny anthill. You go, I let that little thing hold me back from doing all this stuff. And you can't go back to earth and do anything else for him because you're already in heaven because you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for all your sins. But guess what? We're still on this earth. We still have breath in our lungs and feet that trod the soil. You still can do those things that you'll be known for forever. So this is an exciting time. And out of the 6,000 years of history that we talked about, um, the good Lord decided for you to be alive right now. You could have been alive during the bubonic plague or Attila the Hun or Genghis Khan or mm -hmm. you know any Atahualpa in Incan Peru. You could have been alive any of those times, but he chose for you to be alive right now. And the Lord believes that you have what it takes to do great things. It's sort of like a basketball coach going to the bench and saying, okay, it's time for you to get in the game. And you're like, but coach, they're playing really tough out there. Uh, look, somebody just got knocked, knocked down. Go, yeah, 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 it's your turn, get in the game. But coach, look, they're, they're like bumping into each <laughs> other. And Yeah, yeah, you're seven feet tall, they're four feet tall, now get in the game. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. This is your time. It's all in time to crises, people turn to Christ, but it's also time to get great leaders rise up. And so we never would have heard of Washington had it not been for the crisis with King George. He just would have been a Virginia farmer. We never would have heard of Abraham Lincoln had it not been for the crisis of slavery. He just would have been an Illinois attorney, right? It's in times of crises that you get the opportunity to step out in faith and say, I don't know everything, but Lord, use me any way you can, and he'll give you the ideas, he'll give you the strength, and, and you'll be the one to do the great things. Amen. So anyway. <laughs> What's hey, shit, man. Shit, Mike, thank you for this is well, go This is where I want to go with it. So how can they reach you? I got I to gotta say this, because I'm going to do this again in the beginning, but go ahead. What, what, what do we got to do to get a hold of this stuff, man? Uh, AmericanMinute.com is my website, AmericanMinute.com. <clears throat> I send out a free daily history email called American Minute, so something that happened on each date in history. And... Um, uh, just appreciate you uh, having me here. So, no, we we are yeah. so thankful you were <laughs> able to sit down with us. <laughs> so, oh, dude, like, you know, the, the, the irony is, is again, he does this without a presentation. Yeah. I do all my stuff with a presentation because <laughs> <laughs> I can't keep all the thoughts together. You know what I mean? But um, we just want to say that, man, we've been praying for you. Um, we support. Mm -hmm. I saw his stuff at my tables when I go. You know what yeah. I mean? Because there's just so he's asked me before, like, why don't you write a book? I'm like, because you wrote 40 of them, so like I don't need to write anymore. Like, what's the point? No, you already you got the good stuff. You've got the best one in, inside of you. That no, you no, know, man. So, do. guys, look, the, he, most of the books he has too are in DVD form as well, and they they complement. They go very well together, and they're very professionally done. You've had them done in some really good studios, and you know everything he does is top notch, and it's really really solid information. You're not going to find any quirks or qualms matter of fact you have a quotations book too a, a big thick yeah, one I love on american book. quotations and he's gone through it and revised it and you know what was said what wasn't and i mean he did this before the internet era so he was in what libraries researching page by page piece by piece a lot of this information so this isn't just a joke this is where you want knowledge and, and what is it my people are destroyed because they lack knowledge not because they lack power and, and get yourself some knowledge so you can go out there and win the war. So God bless you, Bill, man. We love, we love having you. We're so honored that you're here, man. It's, it's, it's pretty uh, dope. Thank you, Massey and Mike. And uh, you guys are absolutely tremendous. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. We'll see what you, you want to end it out? Sure. All right, guys. We will see you next week. Thank you so much. We love you guys.